Hey, what's up you guys? It's Dorothy and welcome back to my channel. In today's video, we're going to go into chapter 17 of Killing Mr. Griffin by Lois Duncan. Uh, since we are now on this chapter, that means we've only got two more chapters left of this entire book and then we are completely done with it. Um, in the last video, we just found out that Grandma Ruggles is seeing someone in the house that is not David. So let's find out who it was. This video may contain sensitive topics and foul language. If you do not wish to continue, please click off of the video now. You have been warned. Chapter 17. The wind began in the early afternoon. It rose slowly at first, but increased steadily as winds do in the southwest in March, lifting the dust from the vacant lots and unpaved roads and mesas and sending it sweeping into town. The Sunday twilight was muted and pink, and the sun's last rays slanted through the thick red air, and when dark came, the wind did not drop but seemed to grow stronger whining around the corners of houses and stripping the first new leaf buds from the trees. Susan brought two logs in from the pile beside the garage and built a fire. She felt foolish doing it, for the evening was not cold, but for but some inner part of her seemed to be freezing. It took some time before she could get the fire to catch. This chore had always fallen to Craig or her father. Once she had got it going, she sat on the floor, huddled as close as she could to get to the fire screen, taking comfort as much from the friendly crackling sound as far from the heat of the flames. Are you sure you want, won't change your mind and come with us? Her mother had asked one final time before they had left. I know how long, how low you're feeling, but Sunday, but Sunday suppers at the church are always fun and seeing other people might give you a lift. Sorry, I took a squeak toy away from my dog. I'm sure Susan told her. I just can't face it. They're going to be a sing-along, Alex had reminded her. I said I don't want to come. The thought had crowded church basement with her parents' friends chattering and munching and hordes of shrieking children racing between the long food-covered tables had its had in itself been enough to exhaust her. Now alone in the house, she wondered if she had made a mistake as not going. Although she dreamed often of solitude, she had seldom actually experienced it. With the comings and goings of a large family, the McConnell house was seldom empty and almost never silent. Tonight, its absolute stillness accentuated by the moan of the wind outside was oppressive and almost frightening. Hungry, suddenly for the sound of human voices, Susan turned on the television and flicked from channel to channel. On one, a recently divorced actor and his ex-wife were trading insults. On another, a female singer was wailing about the agony of lost love. On the third channel, the first words she heard were Brian Griffin. For Brian Griffin, Del Norte, English teacher, whose body was found yesterday in a shallow grave in the Sandina Mountains, results of the autopsy show cause of death to have been coronary arrest, possibly preceded by a severe and Gina attack. Mr. Griffin's wrists and ankles were bound with twine tightly enough to obstruct circulation to the hands and feet, and there were bruises on his arms and legs. The coroner's report said Miss Catherine Griffin, the wife of the deceased, said that a new prescription from the medication Griffin took for an angina was on order at the Susan turned off the set in the kitchen in a pan on the back of the stove was stew from last night's dinner. Her mother had set it out for her before she had left. Be sure to eat, Sue, she had told her, and Susan had nodded in agreement. Now she went out to the kitchen and stood for a moment in the front of the stove, trying to decide if she would be able to face a meal. The mere smell of food with its combination of onions and spices made her slightly nauseated. She had almost decided to put the whole concoction down the disposal when the doorbell rang. Who in the world? Susan hesitated, feeling reluctant to open the door when she was alone in the house. Then she thought of David. Of course it would be him. Come to give her the follow-up on the situation with the ring. By this time, Mark would have talked with him, and perhaps they would have worked out a solution. Setting the stew pan back on the burner, Susan went to the door and opened it. To her surprise, she found her visitors to be Jeff and Betsy. Are you here alone? Betsy asked, glancing quickly around her. Yes, Susan said. The rest of my family is out for the evening. Well, good. We can talk then. Aren't you going to ask us in? Of course. Come in, Susan said, stepping back to allow them to enter. Both their faces were red from the wind, and Betsy's hair was wild around her face. We're on our way to Zuni, Jeff said. I got the car sprayed gray this morning, and Betsy borrowed the license off of her mom's Honda to use on the drive out there. We figure nobody will be using that car tonight, and we'll get the license back on again before anybody else sees it in the morning. How are you going to get back? Susan asked them. We've got Griffin's car, Betsy said, and Mark's going to follow us and Jeff's. After we dump the Chevy, we'll come back with him. He's going to meet us here in a couple of minutes. The reason we stopped here is to tell you that I told my parents I was spending the night with you. I don't think Mom will check it out. If she wants me, she'll call me on my cell, but if for some reason she does happen to call on your house phone, 
You'll have to handle it. How, Susan asked nervously. Oh, for Christ's sake, you're supposed to be smart. Figure something out. Tell her I'm asleep or in the bathtub or whatever. The main thing is to be sure you get the phone every time it rings tonight. That won't be hard considering your parents are out. The other thing is we've got to to get a hold of Dave, Jeff said. I gave my parents the same story about sleeping at his house. Are you going to see him tonight? Not that I know of, Susan said. We tried to stop at his place on the way over here, Betsy told her, but there was a whole line of cars parked in front like they were giving a party. We didn't think we ought to go in. Let's call him from here, Jeff said. He doesn't have to, he doesn't have a cell. Do you know his number, Sue? No, Susan said, but I can look it up. There's a phone in the den. She led the way into the wood-paneled room where the fire was burning brightly and casting dancing shadows against the far wall. I'll find it, Jeff said, picking up the phone directory, which lay on the stand under the wall. I'll read the numbers out to you and you dial. It'll sound more natural if the call comes from you. Are you ready? 268. Susan pushed the buttons. There was a connecting click and the phone on the other end of the line began to ring. After a moment, a woman's voice answered. Hello, Susan said. Could I speak to David, please? Can I tell him who's calling, the woman asked. It's Susan. Okay, just a minute. The voice moved away from the phone. It's somebody's named Susan for David. Does he want to take a call right now? From somewhere in the background, there was an answer. Susan was aware of the hum of numerous voices. There was a long pause, and then the sound of the receiver being lifted in David's voice. Hello? David, it's Sue. She was not sure he understood. It was she who was calling. What's happening over there? Is something the matter? Yes, David said in a flat voice. My grandmother died this morning. Oh, David, she was stunned. How awful. Yeah, it's pretty awful. It happened while mom and I were at church. We found her lying on the floor in the bedroom. She must have fallen and hit her head when she was getting out of her chair. How awful, Susan said again. Is there anything I can do? The question was ridiculous and she knew it, but it was the only thing she could think of to say. No, David said. What is it that you called about? He was far away from her, so far away that there was no way to touch him. Susan found herself wondering if she would ever touch him again. The scene yesterday in the bedroom between themselves and the old gray-haired woman would stand between them forever. It would be a memory David would want to thrust away from him, and in her presence, it would come surging back to be relieved over and over again. She answered his question. Jeff and Betsy are here. They're on their way to take the Chevy out to the Pueblo. Jeff has told his parents he's spending the night with you and wants you to cover for him if they should call. Try and call him there. I can't do that, David said. Our minister's over here and half the people from the church. It's a regular wake. None of them have seen Graham for years, but you never know it to listen to them. There's no way I can catch the phone when it rings. One of my mom's friends is acting as telephone secretary. Oh, Susan said. Well, Jeff, will just have to change his story, David. The ring, it's not that, it's not, it was not the right time to ask, but she could not let him forget. Have you gotten it? I don't want to think about that right now, David said, but David, you have to. What if somebody else finds it? It has to be there somewhere in the bedroom. I'll hunt through his stuff, but not tonight. There's too much going on over here. He dropped his voice. The spacey woman from next door came over a few minutes ago, and you know what she said? There was a guy in the bedroom with Graham at the time she died. She said she looked across from her bedroom window and saw him standing, talking to Graham back behind her chair. She didn't think anything about it at the time because she thought it was me, but... But how could that there have been anybody, Susan stammered. There couldn't have been, of course, but she's got my mom and everybody else here all riled up. She says the guy was wearing a brown sweater. I don't even own a brown sweater. How much did she see? Susan asked shakily. Did she actually see your grandmother fall? No. She says she looked over once and saw this guy with Graham, and then later she looked again, and Graham wasn't in her chair anymore, and she didn't see anybody. She got to be making the whole thing up. Graham didn't have drop-in visitors, and if she did... Have they sure wouldn't have been teenage guys. I think the woman's cracked. She's using this as a way to get some attention for herself. But what if it was a burglar, Susan said. Is anything missing from the house? Nope. My mom's jewelry, such as it is, is all in the box and there's nothing else here that anybody would want to steal. Look, I've got to get back to mom now. She's taken this hard. David's voice came from years away. Did you want anything else? No, Susan said. I just called about the alibi for Jeff. David, she sought for the words... And could not find them. I'm sorry, she said lamely. Yeah, well, so am I. She was quite an old girl, my Graham. The place is going to seem pretty strange without her. Yes, I'd imagine so. Goodbye, David, she said. Goodbye, David said. Goodbye. Susan replaced the receiver on the hook. Jeff and Betsy were looking at her questioningly. His grandmother died today, Susan said. Well, what about the cover, Jeff asked. He said he can't do it. Shit, that really messes us up if my parents try to get a hold of me. Well, there's nothing to do but take the chance, I guess. He paused, taking in the expression of Susan's face. Hey, what's with you? You look like you're going to kneel over. Mark has a brown sweater, Susan said. He wears it all the time. 
What's that supposed to mean? It means, it means Susan felt the floor tilting strangely beneath her. The room swam about her and she reached out a hand to brace herself against the wall for support. When I told Mark about the ring, he said, don't worry, I'll get it. And there was someone with her when she died. The woman in the house next door saw him. You're not making sense, Betsy said. What ring was Mark going to get? Mr. Griffin's ring, the one that was missing from his finger when they found him. David took it. Dave did, Jeff said in surprise. Why would he do that? Because because she could not try to explain. That part no longer mattered. All that was important now, that was the horrendous realization that was sweeping over her. Mark killed that woman. He went over there this morning while David and his mother were in church and he took the ring from her and killed her. You're crazy, Betsy said. Mark would never do a thing like that. He would, and he did. Suddenly, incredibly, there was no doubt in her mind. We've got to go to the police. Betts is right. You are crazy, Jeff said. After all we've gone through to keep this undercover, you think we're going to go to the cops now? We'd have to tell them everything right from the beginning, the whole bit about the kidnapping and Griffin d dying on us and the burial, and who would ever believe it if it was an accident, especially if you're going to follow it up with this crazy thing about Dave's grandmother. It's gone past the point where there's any choice, Susan said. Whatever they do to us, they'll just have to do. You don't have the right to make that decision, Betsy said. We're all in this together. You agreed to help with the kidnapping, and by doing that, you agreed to anything that followed from it. You've co you're committed just like the rest of us. You can't chicken out now. Didn't you hear a thing I said, Susan asked her? Mark killed Mrs. Ruggles. He killed an old woman. Mr. Griffin's death was an accident. Bruce, quit it. But this wasn't. Mark knew what he was doing. He planned it and killed her. You don't know that, Jeff said. You don't have proof. I do know it, and I do, don't do need proof. The police can find that. Susan was on edge of hysteria. If I'm wrong, if Mark has nothing to do with this, if it really was an accident, the old lady slipped and fell, that will show up from her injuries. They can do an autopsy on her the same way they did on Mr. Griffin. But if he did do it, if he did do it, he did it to protect us. You as well as the rest of us, Betsy said. He was willing to take that risk in order to keep us safe. If Dave was stupid enough to think that ring, take that ring and let his grandmother get a hold of it, what could Mark do but get it back any way he could? But to murder someone? Like Jeff said, you're only guessing about that and you're probably wrong. But if you're not, just remember that Mark did only what he had to do. He's gotten us through this far and we've got to trust him to get us through the rest of the way. I don't care what you say, Susan said miserably. I'm going to the police and I'm going to tell them everything. After that, whatever happens, happens. I'm sorry if the two of you won't back me up. But if you think Mark did only what he had to do, then you can believe the same thing about me. I can't go on like this any longer. It's a snowball rolling downhill. It's getting worse all the time. From the street outside, there came a quick, impatient beep of a car horn. That's Mark, Betsy said. What are we going to do? It won't do us any good to get rid of the car if Miss... Holier, holier than thou is going to spill the beans, Jeff said. We've got to keep her quiet. How? I'll stay here with you, with her. You run out and tell Mark what's happened. He'll think of something. You can't tell Mark, Susan cried. He's the very one. But Jeff's hands were clamped tightly upon her shoulder, and Betsy was already out the door. When she returned a few moments later, Mark was with her. He was still wearing the brown sweater. That is the end of chapter eight, seventeen. I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.